Have you ever wondered what life would be like without the cars and lorries that clog our city highways and line our suburban streets? I know. I was born into the closing years of the horse age. I have ridden in growlers and hansom cabs. I have driven governess carts and farm carts and gigs and traps. I have yoked great Clydesdales and sat high beside the coachman on holiday breaks. I grew up through the innocent infancy of the car, and I fell in love with it, just like you, as soon as I could get my hands on a steering wheel. And we've been together now, Car and I, for over half a century. Most of it was fun, but the fun thing has become a kind of monster. You know, when you look around this place and see the fantastic number of cars they're offering and the the number of the models they all shove at you, it's hard to keep track of them nowadays. It's hard to realize that the car industry is up against it. You know, this place is just a great big festival of Ballyhoo. Look at this. Classical columns to suggest the idea of gracious aristocratic life on four wheels. But there's one thing that does stupefy me, although I'm used to the Earl's Court extravaganza, and that's this. At a time when the average motorist is more concerned probably about petrol consumption than anything else, there's not a word about it in any stand I've seen, and damn little in any of the brochures I've read. I think it's time somebody took the car boys into a quiet corner and explained the facts of motoring life to them. Everywhere gleaming invitations to envy and dreams, but for most of us motorists now, dreams have gone sour. Have a look at this, a reproduction of a vintage car, outside, inside of course it's ultra 1974, have a look at it, drink it all in, did you ever see lamps like that or a radiator to come anywhere near that one, say 12 miles to the gallon, how is that for fuel conservation? Fuel. Must it always be petrol? No hope in steam, electricity. I asked British Leyland Lord Stokes. Well, first of all, electric is, uh, we've got electric cars. I've driven an electric car in London for some time. Uh, first, you make it? Uh, well, we've made some, we've made some prototypes. But uh, the point is, first of all, that if at the present moment, most electricity is generated by oil in this country, and therefore you're using more oil if you use an electric car than if you use the fuel directly into the, into the engine. The, the, the performance of the electric car is not acceptable as a universal car. But petrol-thirsty luxury, they tell me, is still selling well in the Mini E. If I were to buy a Rolls Royce, say if I won the Irish Sweep and the Top Ernie Prize, my friends would say, poor old Robbie's had it. They got him at last, you know. Well, they haven't. But it, it would be fun to try the thing, wouldn't it? And I can always practice the proper down your nose, beat this if you can look. This is the first time I've driven a Rolls Royce. <laughs> it shows you what low company I keep. First, I thought it might be an idea to look the part for this trial. You know, a great big cigar and a look of concentrated tycoonery. But I'm not empty, really. <laughs> not with a hat like mine. She's a honey to drive, and by God, is she ought to be. What do you reckon this thing costs? I'll tell you, but first of all, if you're eating, swallow. I wouldn't like you to choke. This Camargue, Rolls Royce's very latest contribution to national belt tightening, Cost twenty nine thousand two hundred and fifty pounds. Twenty nine thousand two hundred and fifty quid. Clearly, this is something no self-respecting oil sheik could scrape along without. I reckon this two and a half tons of ironmongery must be the ultimate in luxury, effortless transport. You have to walk into it, and you've got to put your hands in the steering wheel and your foot on the pedal, and you have to drive it. No. You don't drive it, you direct it, because pretty well everything else is done for you. Gadgets? <laughs> the damn thing's full of them. I'll stop and let you see. The trouble is really where to begin. Automatic gears, power steering, the last word in air conditioning, uh, stereo radio, quadraphonic cassette player, you never saw anything like it. Automatic nearly everything. Automatic pace setter here. And watch this. I want to go up. I go up. I want to go down. Down. Watch that window. 
<laughs> that fun? There we go. Engine, six and three quarter litres. This car drinks petrol at about 14 miles to the gallon. A tank full, 23 gallons, would cost you 17 pounds, roughly. And this thirsty monster pays just the same excise tax as the smallest car on the road. Some of us thought they might have taxed according to engine capacity. Well, they will one day, I guess, whatever government's in power. That's to say, if you can talk about governments and power these days. Well, here goes. Well, it's an experience. And golly, so is this. I never thought I'd get a chance to drive a Model T Ford again. Last time it was about 1919. If you're over 60, you'll not argue with me when I tell you I'm driving the most famous car in the history of motoring, the Model T Ford. The car old Henry said you could have in any color you liked, as long as it was black. Tin Lizzie, the mechanical workhorse of the first real horseless generation. These cars sold as fast as Henry Ford could make them because they were cheap and reliable. They were built for punishment by motoring innocents. And Henry's dealers didn't sell you this car on bums and bosoms. They showed you what it could do, including among many headline stunts, a climb to the top of Ben Lomond. But after today's sophisticated machinery, this needs concentration, as you can see. Your left pedal is your gear lever, and there's nothing but hunch to tell you where neutral is. This takes me back a bit, and I find it just as much of a devil to drive and to get out of as I did long, long ago. As you can see. Henry Ford sold 15 millions of these, 15 millions, and gave personal mobility and geographical freedom a new dimension. I drove one of these during the First World War, illegally because I was a bit too young. And I thought, we all thought, it was a marvellous machine. But those of you who are old-timers like me would agree, would you not, that none of us ever foresaw the awful, worsening and irreversible social consequences brought about by the unnumbered millions of sophisticated, barley offspring of good old tin lizzie.